This evening, I'm going to be giving a presentation on the anatomy and physiology of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And uh, this is obviously very appropriate uh, for Good Friday to talk about the crucifixion. And um, you might be wondering how I became interested in this topic. And when I was in college and was taking anatomy and physiology, uh, my professor actually gave a short presentation on this topic. And what it did was really gave me a greater appreciation for what Jesus did for us on the cross. Uh, especially from a, from a physical standpoint, to understand a little bit better what he went through. And after graduate school, I actually taught at a Christian college uh, for a number of years, and I had the privilege of teaching anatomy and physiology. And the very first year that I taught, I knew that I was going to give a presentation on uh, this topic around Easter time uh, because it was so impactful to me, and I wanted others to learn uh, that information as well. So I've been giving a presentation on this topic for nearly 20 years now. And while I think it is a very important topic to discuss, it's definitely um, one of the most difficult presentations that I've ever had to give. But my hope and the reason that I do this is that you will walk away this evening with a greater appreciation for what Christ did for you on the cross and realize just how important the history that is presented in Genesis is to the very purpose of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let's start off with a little bit about the um, history of crucifixion. So and was invented by the Persians and was actually a major form of capital punishment uh, from about the 6th century BC to about the 4th century AD. It was actually, though, perfected by the Romans, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, it was used, the Romans used it for slaves, foreigners, revolutionaries, vile criminal, criminals. They typically didn't use it against their own citizens um, because it was considered so horrific. Uh, we actually get a word um, in our English language from the word crucifixion, and that is um, excruciate, okay? So if, if someone says they're in excruciating pain, we usually understand that to mean great agony or torment. So that word excruciate comes from crucifixion. It literally means from or out of the cross. And so our knowledge of crucifixion comes not only from the Bible, obviously, but also from Jew Jewish and Roman historians. So let's talk a little bit about the events leading to the crucifixion before we get to that event itself, because it plays a role and it's important to understand in Jesus' suffering, and it's actually relevant to the crucifixion. So let's start in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Gethsemane means oil press. And uh, oil is often used to symbolize uh, the spirit of the Lord. Uh, in 1 Samuel 16, 13, it says, So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, meaning David, in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. So it's used to symbolize uh, the spirit. So we could say there at Gethsemane that the spirit of God was crushed right, as he prays in earnest. Now, I'm going to be showing you um, a clip from the movie of the Passion of the Christ that came out in 2004. And I'll show several of those clips throughout this presentation. And the reason that I do that is because it, it illustrates, I think, very graphically um, and very visually uh, some of what Jesus went through. Uh, I think images and pictures and videos like this can, can do more to relay that to you than I can in words. Um, it's not a perfect movie, obviously, but it is uh, fairly true to history and scriptures for the most part. So that's why I like to use it in this presentation to give you, uh, again, more of a sense of what Jesus went through. So let's just watch a short clip now from the garden scene. Okay, so scripture um, describes this scene of Jesus praying uh, by saying this, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So I want to talk first about that part of being in agony, and when we look up the Greek word for that, it's agonia, and what's interesting is that's the only usage of that particular word, agonia, in the New Testament, and it means violent struggle or severe mental struggles and emotion, and and um, again, it's hard for us to sort of grasp that because Jesus is taking on sins, right? He's taking on sin on himself. Yet he is the perfect sinless son of God, but he's taking sin. He's taking that punishment, that wrath of God for those sins on himself. 
Uh, and we have no concept of what that's like, but that is what Jesus did, even though he was sinless. Now, as a result of what's going on spiritually and mentally, um, it has a physical outcome um, as well, and that is hematidrosis or bloody sweat. And you can see that in the clip there. Um, you can see these dark spots on Jesus's faith. And so this is a rare bleeding disorder. Jesus is not the only person to have experienced this. Other people have as well, but it is caused by extreme extreme stress. And for reasons we don't fully understand, uh, the, the sweat glands are very vascular, right? They have a lot of capillaries around them. And under extreme stress, those capillaries rupture and they leak into the sweat glands, all right? And so when the person sweats, blood comes out with it. So it looks like they are sweating blood. Now, obviously a person isn't gonna bleed to death this way, but the skin does become very tender and fragile as a result of that. So this shows you a cross section of the skin and I'm circled there uh, where the sweat gland is. And then the capillaries, which you kind of see there, uh, they are all around that sweat gland. And so they'll rupture, leak into it, and then the person sweats both obviously sweat, but also blood with that as well. So Jesus is under, Jesus, remember, he's fully God and he's fully man. So while he is taking the sins of the world, sins of sinners, obviously on himself and the punishment for that sin, it has a physical outcome. All right, so next um, we have the Jewish trial. So they, he was arrested at Gethsemane after midnight. Um, he's questioned at the temple by various uh, religious leaders of that day, and he is found guilty of blasphemy and sentenced to death. Now, I want you to keep in mind a couple of things here. First of all, there were a lot of illegal aspects to his trial by both Jewish standards and by Roman standards. And secondly, that he's found guilty of blasphemy, right? So he claimed to be God. Now, of course, it isn't blasphemy because he is God, right? We know that, but they didn't want to believe that. They chose not to believe that. And so keep that in mind for a little bit later when we talk about the Roman trials, because we're going to see the charge there as actually different than blasphemy. For me. So what is Jesus's physical and mental condition at this point? So we have to remember something. Again, Jesus is fully God, but he is also fully man. And so Peter has denied him three times and all the disciples have deserted him. All right, so how must that feel? These people that you have invested your life in, that Jesus has invested his life in for the last three, three or so years now have left him, right? And they've even, even Peter's gone to the point of denying he even knew him. Right? So that has to have an impact on him from a, from a human perspective. Uh, the guards have blindfolded him, they taunted him, they spit on him, um, and he's been struck by guards with their fists. Now again, all of this that I'm, that I'm gathering here and telling you can be found in the Gospels themselves. I just don't put the, the scriptures up here because it would get kind of busy, but you can read that um, in um, in the scriptures. And, and again, his spiritual condition, right? He is, again, we have to think about that. It, it's easy to miss, I think, but he's taking on sin. He's taking on God's wrath for that sin. So next starts his Roman trials because the Jews needed to gain permission for execution from the Romans, obviously, because they're under Roman rule. So he appears before Pilate, who is the Roman governor at that time. And they, the Jews now charge him as being a self-appointed king. Now that's interesting because originally in the Jewish trials, he was charged with blasphemy. But the Romans would have cared nothing about that, right? Because they had lots of gods. So what was one more, right? They, they wouldn't have cared that he claimed to be God or a God. Um, that wouldn't have bothered them. But it would have bothered them that someone was trying to be king, right? So that's why he was charged a little bit different, uh, differently there. And Pilate could find nothing wrong. Pilate didn't really have a good relationship with the Jewish people. He didn't want to deal with this situation. And so he sent him to Herod, who is the Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea. Uh, Herod could find nothing wrong with him either. Herod just wanted to show, basically, right? He's like, do these things, you know, for me. Um, show me who you are. And so they mocked him, obviously. They dressed, this is the first time we see Jesus dressed in a robe. Um, they beat him. But again, Herod, Herod was just trying, to, and Pilate, were trying to appease the Jews, right? They couldn't really find anything wrong with Jesus, but they didn't want to give, they didn't want to, you know, 
um, they wanted to basically kind of keep passing it back and forth between the two of them to try to not deal with this problem because they weren't finding Jesus guilty. So he sends him back to Pilate. Um, a second time now, he appears before Pilate. Pilate could still find nothing wrong. Um, his wife has even come to him and warned him not to have anything to do with this situation. And um, so it's customary at that time to release a prisoner. So now I don't know what's going through Pilate's mind, but I'm wondering if he's thinking, okay, so I'm going to give them a choice. This is how I'm going to get out of this. I'm going to give them a choice between Jesus and a known murderer, right, Barabbas. Uh, that's their choices. And certainly they'll let Jesus go at that point because they know Barabbas is a murderer. You know, I'll, he'll, I'll get off this way. Now, again, I don't know that's what he's thinking, but I, but I kind of, that's what maybe I might be thinking if I was trying to get out of this situation. But um, the crowds um, didn't want right, uh, Jesus. They wanted Barabbas. It just shows you how they were, again, so against him. And so he gave in to the crowds and released Barabbas instead of Jesus, and he surrendered Jesus for crucifixion. We even see a point where he washes his hands, right? And that's not a Roman custom. That would be going to a Jewish custom. Uh, at that time, basically, if someone was uh, murdered and the leaders could not find the murderer, they would wash their hands of the situation, saying they, you know, there's nothing more that they can do. And the same is true here. So he's kind of showing them, hey, I'm washing my hands in this situation. I'm not guilty, even though he is. Um, and it's, your, it's on your heads, basically, that this is happening. All right, so what is his physical and mental condition at this point? Well, first of all, Jesus is still feeling the effects of hematidrosis. Um, he's been abandoned and denied by his close friends. He's been physically beaten and mocked. He's sleep deprived, because again, all of this occurred basically overnight and into the next day. He's walked approximately two and a half miles and to our knowledge, he's been given no food or water at this point. So again, it's important to think about all of these things because um, it helps us understand Jesus' physical state and even mental state and spiritual state as he goes into the next part of it. So the next part is the scourging or um, the flogging. And this was the legal preliminary to every Roman execution with few exceptions. And so the instrument that was used would vary. And when you watch this clip, you'll actually see a table where they have several of those instruments. Um, but the one that they'll use the most in this particular clip is a short whip that had several single or braided leather tongs on it. And on those tongs were tied uh, iron balls um, and or sharp pieces of bone that were tied at intervals. And so, again, this is a very um, graphic clip, but I think it's important to have, a, again, a greater appreciation for uh, the horrific, the, how horrific it was what Jesus went through. So let's watch. <laughs> So it's a, it's a very challenging scene to watch, obviously. And when I watch it, I, I can't help but think, you know what? He didn't have to do this, right? He's God. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't do anything to deserve this. I did, right? We did. He could have wiped those people out in an instant, right? He could have been completely free of that situation, but he chose not to, right? He chose not to out of his great love for us, right? He wanted to obey the Father's plan, Right? This was how God had determined that our sins would be forgiven and so that we could have a relationship with him and we can live eternally with him in heaven. So the procedure there that you see, um, the individual is stripped. They don't obviously have very many clothes on. Um, their hands are tied to a post of some kind or chained. Uh, they scourge the back, the buttocks, and the legs. Now, in this movie later, um, in this particular scene, they actually turn Jesus over and they scourge him on the front. That's probably more for a dramatic effect than it is reality because doing that would potentially cause them to rip into vital internal organs, which would cause the person and to die before they got to the crucifixion, and they don't want that, all right? So um, the back, the buttocks, and the legs tend to have more fat and muscle, and they protect the organs, so that's probably where they would have done most of the scourging. Um, two soldiers, as you saw in the movie clip, or one that alternated position, and there was no limit. Um, and again, in the movie, they don't limit themselves. Um, technically, Jewish law said 39, but why should we think that they obeyed the law when it came to this? They didn't in many other aspects of Jesus's trial and leading up to this, so there's no reason to think that they would have done that. Now, this particular image I'm showing you comes from an article that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association back in the mid-'80s. It's a very good article. You can find it freely online. It's called On the Physical Death of Jesus Christ, and it's a very comprehensive article uh, dealing with the crucifixion, probably one of the best ones that I found out there. 
And so I encourage you to um, get that if you have more of interest in this and read it. You can see Jesus um, tied here actually to a taller post, but again, tied or chained to some kind of post and scourging, again, the back, the buttocks, and the leg. So the whole idea of the weapon that they're actually using, um, and again, Romans were very good at what they did, sadly, with hurting people. So the little iron balls um, would basically um, tenderize. It's, it's like acting like a meat tenderizer almost, because it would beat the, the back and, and, you know, that those parts of Jesus. And then the sharp things, after it's been beat and thinned out a little bit, will rip into it. It's easier for it to rip into the skin. So it's sadly, it's just kind of like tenderizing it and then being able to rip into it better. So the result, as you saw, is a bloody mass of bone and muscle. And so the individual, depending on how severe it is, might start to undergo shock from blood loss. Um, Literally, the flesh ends up in strips or ribbons as a result of this. Very deep bruising, uh, laceration. And this would weaken the victim. And the extent of this would then determine their time on the cross. Now, m as the movie portrays, and as we often think, Jesus was beat very, very severely. Um, and, I, and I think he was. But it's hard to sort of get that idea from the scripture itself, at least in the gospels, because it says, it just says, and when he had scourged Jesus. So there's no indication of the severity actually in the gospels themselves. But I do think there's a lot of other evidence in the scripture that would lead us to believe it was very severe. And one of those is in 1 Peter. And it says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. All right, so stripes, if we look up the Greek word for that, it's molops. And that, again, is the only usage of that particular Greek word in the New Testament. Now, in the, in, in the original language, even though it has an S on the end, it is actually singular. So it's literally saying by his stripe, okay, is how we would say that in English. And it could indicate that Jesus's back was so severely beaten that it just looked like a single wound, right? A mass, a bleeding, bruised tissue. Um, it means a bruise or well or wound, welt, um, a wound that trickles with blood. Uh, and it may, again, indicate the seriousness, uh, seriousness of Jesus' scourging. So I'll talk about a few other verses that I think indicate that as well as we go along here. Now, there was additional mocking and beating of Jesus. So one of the first things they did after this was place on him a scarlet robe and a crown of thorns. So let's watch a, a clip. So they placed on him a crown of thorns, and um, it probably was from this tree, which is called the Zizifus Spina Christi, because it's believed, again, that that's what they would have used. I had the privilege of visiting Israel uh, last year and actually saw uh, this particular tree, and it is extremely thorny, uh, and where these, grow, these thorns that grow on it. And um, when they were trying to put it into the shape of a crown, it may have actually been more like a helmet because this is very hard to deal with. Those thorns are about an inch in length. Um, if you live in an area where they have uh, honey locust trees or locust trees, you've seen these. Um, we have some on our property and they are very uh, painful if you um, run into them. And uh, so this would have been extremely painful. Uh, he was struck, we know, on the head with the staff and they showed that. The scalp is very vascular and there's a lot of nerve endings in it. You know, if you've ever cut your forehead, it's very painful. Um, there's a lot of blood that comes from that and a lot of pain because of damaging those nerves there. So he was mocked, obviously, he was spit on, and even his beard was pulled out. Now people might say, okay, where's that in the Gospels? Well, that part isn't. Um, that actually comes from the Old Testament. And what's fascinating to me is that I always say I could probably make a talk on the crucifixion from the Old Testament alone. Um, and that's because there's probably more details about crucifixion in the Old Testament than there is in the New Testament. But what's really fascinating about that is that at the time that the Old Testament was written, the books of Isaiah and the books of um, uh, the Psalms written by David, those written by David, uh, those were written hundreds of years before crucifixion was even a form of capital punishment. So David and Isaiah had never seen a crucifixion, yet they wrote about it in very precise detail, specifically about Jesus's crucifixion. But 
the only way that they could know those details is if they came directly from God, right? And it shows us again that this is God's word. These words come directly from God. In Isaiah, we read, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. And so we know he's being mocked. We know he's being horrifically beaten, even to the point of pulling out his beard. They then later took off the robe because he's not gonna have that when he's on the cross. And you can imagine if he's got this tremendous, these tremendous wounds, they put this robe on him and then they take it off. And I'm sure they did not take it off nicely. It would have reopened all of those wounds because it would stick to it. And that again would be very painful. In fact, scripture says he was so severely beaten that he did not look like a human being. And, and again, this is why I say before he even got to the cross, that scourging and everything that they did to him after that was extreme. And I always say this is where I believe the movie falls short because he still looked like a human being in the movie. I don't know how you beat a human being to the point where they don't look like a human being. And we read that again in Isaiah. It says, as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of children of mankind. So that's how severely beaten that Jesus was. This is before he even got to the cross. All right, so what is his physical condition at this point? You can obviously see it's going to be very deteriorated. Uh, He's in a pre-shock to a shock state. Specifically, he's undergoing hypovolemic shock. And when we say hypovolemic, it means his volume is low, okay, because he's lost a lot of blood and fluid at this point. So some of the symptoms are that the individual's obviously bleeding, um, they're cold, clammy, and sweaty. And the reason for that is because in this, in a shock state, the blood is going to be preferentially shunted to the, the heart and the brain, because you've got to keep those things going, right, or the individual dies. So the extremities, like the hands and the feet and those things would start to feel very cold. Um, because blood's being taken away from them. And again, to our knowledge, he's not had any water or food intake at this point, but he's losing a lot of blood volume. All right, so before we get to the crucifixion, let's talk about the cross itself. So there's two parts to a cross. There's the stipes, which is the upright post, and then you have the patibulum, which is the horizontal crossbar. Now, Jesus's cross was probably what we call towel-shaped, which means it looked like an uppercase T, not a lowercase T like we typically represent, just because that was a very common cross shape at that time. Um, Jesus would have only carried the patibulum, which was about 75 to 125 pounds. Um, Now, in almost, I think, every dramatic presentation I've ever seen of the crucifixion, Jesus carries the entire cross. And I understand for dramatic purposes why people do that. But reality was they only carried the crossbar, and they would have been tied to that um, somehow. They would have carried that. And then when they got to the place of crucifixion, the patibulum was then mounted onto the stipes, probably on the ground, and then they were raised up. Um, to what we typically think of as the cross structure. Also, the Romans added a sedile or a sedulum, which is a block of wood positioned either below the feet or below the buttocks. And this C actually prolonged um, crucifixion. All right? And we're going to talk a little bit later about why that is the case. So you can see here in this image, you can see the patibulum, which Jesus is tied to or somehow secured to it because that's what he would have carried. Um, the stipes is usually either it's already in the ground at the place of crucifixion or it's on the ground and they're going to mount that um, patibulum with the person on it onto that stipes. Uh, you can see the block of um, wood there, the sedile or the sedulum, and again, either below the feet or below the buttocks, and the towel shape, you see the uppercase T, and the titleist, which gives the charge against that person, which in Jesus' case was being uh, king of the Jews. Now, We know that Jesus carried the patibulum for some period of time, but again, he was so apparently weakened, so badly beaten that he could not carry it all the way to where the crucifixion occurred. And so Simon of Cyrene was forced to carry it at that point. And at at some point along the way to where the crucifixion was, he was offered wine mixed with myrrh, which is also called gall. Now that is a pain reliever. It's an analgesic. Jesus tasted it and refused. And I think that's especially important to think about because he refused it. Why? Because nothing could take away the punishment that he had to pay for our sins. Nothing. Nothing could take away the pain. Nothing could take away God's wrath for our sin on himself. Nothing, right? He had to bear it all. So let's watch a little bit then of the scene of Jesus being nailed to the cross. So again, as we watch that, we have to think about that. He went through that for us, right? He didn't have to, but he chose to. 
right? He wanted to do that so our relationship with God could be restored, right? So that we could live eternally with him in heaven. And what a great, great sacrifice that was. Um, we're not deserving of that, right? But, but because of God's plan, right? He had a plan from the very beginning. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. He had a plan um, to save us, right? To allow us to know Christ as our Savior and to be eternally with him. So we see that his hands uh, were nailed to the cross. These are not nails like we think of nails. These are iron spikes. So they're about five to seven inches in length. Um, and it was either through the palms um, or through the wrist. Now, the Greek word for hand there doesn't indicate, I mean, that always includes the whole hand, including the wrist. So we don't know exactly from scripture. Some people say, it couldn't have been the palms because the body weight would have caused them just to fall off the cross. But um, I talked to our anatomist here, Dr. Minton, and he says he doesn't think that. There's a lot of strong um, uh, connective tissue in there that probably could support the weight of the body. But either way, either through the palms or the wrist, he was, we know he was nailed to the cross. Now doing that, again, either way, would have damaged what's called the median nerve, which runs right through the middle of the wrist and up into the hand and then spreads out. So damaging that nerve is going to cause a condition called causalgia, which is literally like radiating shocks of pain throughout uh, the arms. And it would have had, regardless of where he was nailed, it had to be between the bones. None could be broken. And the reason for that is because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice, right? He is the ultimate Passover lamb. And so according to the Old Testament, no bones could be broken of the Passover lamb. And so the way that this particular article chose to um, uh, talk about this was that it was through the wrist, right? And so, again, a little bit different um, from the movie there. Obviously, they had it through the palm. But uh, either way, you're talking an amazing amount of pain as a result of that. And whether it's through the wrist or through the palm, um, it, could, it is possible not to break the bones. It's probably a little bit easier through the palm not to do that. But either way, we know that no bones could be broken because he is the ultimate sacrificial lamb. Now, one of the things that's a little hard to understand from the clip, because you notice that they're, they're pulling his um, arm out to reach where the hole was for the nail, so they're dislocating his shoulder in the clip to get out. So you might get the impression that he's pulled tight like this, um, what we would call a T position. But actually, when he's hung up on the cross, his arms are flexed, so it's a Y position like this. And... Um, but nonetheless, as he either whether his arms are dislocated, as you saw in the clip there, when he's on the ground or um, or not, when he gets up on the cross, when that cross is finally put up, the weight of the body actually dislocates um, the shoulders as well as possibly the elbows, and so very painful. And we get that idea from Psalm 22:14 as well. It says, "I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. Uh, my heart is like wax that has melted within me." So we get that idea of bone being out of joint from um, this Messianic psalm. Now next, his feet were nailed to the cross, and it was either um, through the feet or the ankles. And I'll, let me talk about that in a minute. But either way, you're going to damage, again, major nerves, the peroneal nerves, and that's going to cause the causalgia, the radiating shocks of pain throughout the leg. And you do understand this from this particular clip. So the knees, you can see, were um, flexed, right? They're bent. Um, they put that piece of wood, they had it so his legs were bent up. And so they would have been bent and rotated a little bit laterally. And we'll talk about why that's important again in a little bit as well. Now, whether it was through the ankle or through the actual uh, foot itself, no bones could be broken, again, because he is the ultimate sacrificial lamb. Now, in this particular um, uh, article, they chose to show it as being through the feet. So one foot on top of the other, and then through the middle um, on the cross. However, archaeological evidence from um, this time period, uh, we do have, I was, again, I was privileged to go to Israel last year and see um, this in the Israeli museum. It's one of the few evidences that we have of crucifixion. It actually shows the nail um, going through the ankle, all right, so, or the iron spike. So the feet were actually on either side 
side of the stipes and nailed in from the, from the sides. So that, is, that seems to be more um, consistent, like I say, thinking about it that way because that's consistent with the archaeological evidence. But either way, no bones broken and d it would damage a lot of nerves either way. So a lot of pain as a result of that. Some other aspects of the crucifixion, they would hang the titleist above the victim. Um, they would taunt and mock the victim as he was on the cross. Insects, birds, and animals, which, while this is really hard to think about, they would burrow into the wounds, they would pick at and devour the body. I think a lot of times we have this idea that Jesus was, um, or any person that was crucified was like really far off the ground, but the reality is they were much closer to the ground itself. And so um, some people, not Jesus, but some people were on the cross for days. And so it's very likely then that animals would have access to them and um, obviously terrible things as a result of that as they're hanging there. And we know um, that we Jesus' captors were there. It's possible that there was demonic activity as Jesus suffered on the cross. And again, I'm going to show you why from Scripture. And obviously, being forsaken by the Father. In Psalms, in Messianic Psalm, we read, Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. And so this this could be reference to, obviously, his captors, the people that were against him, but even to um, the devil himself, right? Because 1 Peter 5, 8 says, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Okay, so we have that roaring lion there, which may indicate that. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. So again, we see a lot of animal imagery, which may indicate Jesus' captors and or that demonic activity. And then finally, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So the Father's wrath on the Son, right, for our sin, right? Because remember, Jesus is sinless. He is the perfect sinless Son of God, yet he took our sins on himself, and he took the wrath of God for that sin on himself and died for us. But what actually leads, from a, at least from a physical standpoint, to death on the cross? And you might find this surprising, but people actually die from asphyxiation or suffocation. And let me explain why. So individuals on the cross actually have a problem with breathing out. Okay, so when we breathe, um, our rib, when we breathe in, inhalation, our rib cage goes up and out, and it's an active process, and air comes in. But when we breathe out, it's a passive process. So the elastic tissue that's around our lungs and in our lungs recoils, okay, it sort of bounces back, the muscles relax, and when that happens, our rib, rib cage falls down, and the air goes out. But when an individual is on a cross like this, their breathing muscle, their all of this is pulled very tight, right? The breathing muscles, their lung tissue, the muscles across the chest are pulled very tight. And because the weight of their arms and the weight of the body is on the arms and they're slouching down. And so you've got all this weight here. So there can be no passive exhalation. It, can't, it doesn't snap back, so to speak, to push the air out. So they can't passively exhale on the cross. But they have to be able to breathe, right? Because otherwise you'd die very quickly. So the only way to breathe is to basically go from, like we said, sort of a, a Y position to more of a T position. They have to sort of straighten up and be able to take the weight off that um, area of their chest and those muscles in order for the air to be able to come out. So that's the only way that they can breathe from moving from what we call, again, sort of the, the Y position to more of a T position, sort of straightening up. And you see that illustrated in this image here a little bit. Um, Again, that takes the weight off the chest muscles, um, off the lungs, basically, so that they can recoil and the air can come out. So every time the person takes a breath on the cross, I want you to think about that. Every single time they have to um, move they have to go up, right, from the, from the Y position to a more straight position, a T position, in order to breathe out. So you can imagine how difficult this is and how extremely painful this is, right? Because they're going to have to rotate the wrist about, or the, or the palm, the other one, about the nails to do this. So severe pain in their arms. The back, the buttocks, and the legs, which have been severely beaten, we know in Jesus' case, are going to scrape against that cross. And I'm sure it's not finely sanded wood, right? I'm sure that's extremely painful. This is not going to be some sort of fluid movement, right? It's going to be rough. It's going to be up and then slump back down very quickly, most likely. So that's going to be a lot of uh, pain on the feet. 
Now, I mentioned about that set aisle, right? That's either below the feet in the case of the movie, which you saw in the crucifixion scene, or below the buttocks. And here's what that does. The reason it prolongs uh, crucifixion is it because it gives him sort of a resting point, okay? So either a way to sit down a little bit or a push-off point for their feet to allow them to get up to be able to breathe out. That's how it prolongs crucifixion because it gives them more time. It basically gives them sort of a resting area to be able to breathe in and out longer. So when a person is breathing like this, um, the breathing becomes very shallow. Uh, portions of the lungs begin to collapse and the end individual has hypoxia or low oxygen. Now, Jesus still managed to say seven phrases. Think about that. It's so challenging to even breathe, right, in and out. Yet, there were things that Jesus needed to say, right, and wanted to say, and so he did um, say those things. Now, as a result of the lack of oxygen, muscles begin to cramp, and they have what we call titanic contractions, and you might think about this in relation to tetanus, um, and it the reason is because your muscles actually need oxygen to relax. And if you don't have oxygen, your muscles stay um, really firm, basically, and they can't relax. They stay contracted. And so <laughs> that's going to be problematic, again, if you're trying to raise yourself up every time to breathe out. A respiratory acidosis starts to occur. There's a buildup of carbon dioxide in the blood because the individual's not breathing very well. The blood gets more acidic as a result of this, and that causes body cells not to function properly. It's kind of like if you think about after you've done really heavy exercise, if you ran a bunch, you get lactic acid buildup as well as some CO2 buildup, but um, mainly it's from a different kind of acid and you feel like, oh, like jelly, like your muscles can't work. That's how this individual is feeling on the cross. Now, as a result of all these things happening, the body, the brain signals the body to breathe more and to the heart to pump more to try to um, compensate for this, right? To offset that. But that's pretty hard to do, right? In the condition that he's in. Uh, we know that Jesus was dehydrated. Um, and the reason for that is because he says, I am thirsty, right? He, he is, to our knowledge, he's not been given anything to drink this entire time. So he's given wine vinegar on a stick, which is not a pain reliever at all. So as a result of being dehydrated, the blood that he does have then, which isn't very much at this point, is very viscous or very thick. So he, it's not able to move through the body very well and give him the oxygen that he needs. And during shock, like I said before, blood is preferentially um, shunted to the brain and the heart. Or, sorry, the brain, uh, once you get farther along in it, not even the heart. And so the heart and other muscles start to die from lack of oxygen and organs as well. And so an individual um, then usually on the cross would succumb to myocardial infarction, right, or cell death. So it, it which starts to lead to cardiac arrhythmias. The heart is dying, um, so it can't send electrical signals correctly anymore. You've got a lot of increased fluid production around the lungs and the heart, uh, the pleural areas and the pericardial areas. You get pulmonary edema, which is fluid in the lungs because the blood pressure has dropped so much. It causes actually the liquid part of the blood to squeeze out into the lungs. And so the lungs are getting fluid filled, so it makes it harder to breathe. And eventually the individual would probably die of a heart attack uh, so the, or a cardiac rupture. The heart would literally burst uh, as a result of this. Now, all of these were likely contributing factors to Jesus's physical death on the cross. Now, I want to make this very, very clear because Jesus is obviously unique. Um, he is God and he is man. And um, so it's different for him in this sense than anyone else because scripture clearly records that he gave up his life willfully, right? No one can take it from him, not even all of this. Now, not, not to say that these things didn't happen. They did physically from a standpoint. These are things that his body would have been going through, but he made the decision to die right? No one could take that from him. And we know that very clearly. Um, uh, we read that in both Luke and John. Now, Jesus's death actually was very quick. It was approximately three to six hours that he spent on the cross. A scripture even records that Pilate was surprised. So again, that may be an indication to some degree, at least from a physical standpoint, that his beating was very severe. Now, he died. And then, so the soldiers came around to take him off the cross and they did not have to break his legs. Now, you might think, what is that? 
you know, why, what, why would they talk about that? If an individual is on a cross, think about this, and they break the legs, if they want to get a person off the cross quickly, they would just break their legs. What would that do? They can't lift up anymore, right? They can't lift up to breathe out, and so they would suffocate very quickly um, as a result of that. But for Jesus, they didn't have to do that because he was already dead. And again, that fulfills a prophecy because no bones could be broken. But just to be sure, they confirmed his death by a spear through the side. Now, I know there are some ideas out there that Jesus um, nearly passed out on the cross. He swooned. He didn't really die. There is no way that the Romans would have left someone off the cross if they truly weren't dead, right? They were perfectionists at what they did. Um, so they confirmed his death by a spear through the side. And you can see that illustrated here. So that spear, I knew what they were doing would have most likely pierced the heart and the lungs, right? So no individual is going to live if they were even alive, which Jesus wasn't, but after that. And so the scripture records that blood and water came out, water likely from the cavity surrounding the heart and the lungs, and then blood from the heart. Now, if it ended there, if that was it, and Jesus died, we would have no hope of eternal life. Because if Jesus can't defeat death, then neither can we. And we would have no reason to serve God because he would be dead. Right? In scripture, Paul makes that clear. He says, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Right? There would be no point. And, um, and so that's one area where I think the movie really falls short. Because I think you know, we go through these horrific things that Jesus had to suffer. Right? And they are horrific, and it shows us how horrible our sin is and what God thinks of that. But then the good news is, right, he resurrected. He did not stay dead. He died on Friday, but he resurrected on Sunday. And so we, we know that from Scripture, and that's the greatest part of all of that. And you get a little sense of that from the movie, but I think it would have ended a lot better, right, had they shown that more. And, and we could celebrate in that, that he did not stay dead. So while this isn't the end of the story, like I say, in some respects, because Jesus did resurrect, it is the end of my ability to scientifically analyze um, the situation or to talk about it from a, from a physical standpoint. Because some people have called this my resurrection talk, which I always kind of laugh because if I was talking about uh, resurrection from a scientific or physical standpoint, it would be very short, right? Because it's a miracle. Right? These things don't happen. It, it is one of the greatest miracles ever, and it's completely beyond science. But even though I can't understand it from a scientific perspective, it doesn't make me believe it any less. I absolutely am confident that Jesus resurrected. And how do I know that? I know that from his word. I know that from eyewitness accounts that are given in his word. And Paul really summarizes these in 1 Corinthians. He talks about that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. He was seen by by over 500 brethren at once. He was seen by James, then by all the apostles. And we have several accounts of him appearing to the disciples and um, on, on several occasions, but one of the most well-known, obviously, is when he appeared to Thomas, because Thomas wasn't there the first time he appeared, so he, got, he gets the moniker of doubting Thomas, right? But then he did appear eventually when Thomas was there. And he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hand and reach your hand here and put it into my side, right from where the spear went through. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. He stayed on earth after his resurrection to help people believe that he had resurrected, to help them know. He wanted people to stop doubting and believe. And when I read that, um, I think about us here at the Creation Museum and our tagline of prepare to believe. You know, Christians don't reject the resurrection. Um, we're actually very quick to believe it and to defend it because we realize how problematic it is for Christianity if the resurrection didn't happen, right? Because if Jesus is dead, then we're still dead in our sins and we have no hope of eternal life. But what I find is that many Christians do not accept or believe the Genesis account of creation. They don't accept Genesis as history, that God created in six 24-hour days approximately 6,000 years ago. And in fact, they're very quick to reject it um, on, on sometimes. And so they don't realize, though, how problematic that is for Christianity. And it's related to the whole purpose of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, the reason that Jesus needed to die on the cross where does that start? 
It starts back in the Garden of Eden. And we read in Genesis, it says, but of the tree of knowledge, this is God speaking, of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Right? He told that to Adam. We know how Eve had knowledge of that. But there was no disease and death and suffering in God's original perfect creation. But if they sinned, if they disobeyed God, that's exactly what would happen. And that's exactly what they did. Right? They ate from the tree, and as a result, we have death and suffering. And so that's why it's so important to understand that Genesis is history. That's why Jesus needed to die on the cross, because we're all descended from Adam and Eve. We all have that sin nature. We're all sinners, and we're all in need of the redemption and God loved us so much, right, that he sent his son to die for us. He didn't have to, right? He's God, but he chose to because he loves us so much. But a lot of Christians don't accept Genesis as true history and what I'm showing there on the screen. Instead, they believe that God used evolution over millions of years. And If God did that, then that means there was millions of years of death, disease, and suffering before Adam even came into existence. But if that's the case, and the only conclusion that we can draw from Scripture is that God thinks death is very good, right? Because that's what he said after he finished his creation. In Genesis 131, he declared it very good. But if that took him millions of years of death, disease, and suffering um, to bring about mankind and every, every other living thing as supposedly recorded in the fossil record, then we've got a major problem. Because now, instead of death and sin being linked, we've unlinked them, right? No longer is the wages of sin death. Because instead of death being the punishment for sin, we've got death millions of years before Adam and Eve even exist to sin. And that's a problem. And that idea is completely inconsistent with the Bible because sin and death are always linked, right? For the wages of sin is death. Death is the punishment for sin. God does not view death as good, much less very good. And so believing in evolution in millions of years undermines the authority of the Bible because that means part of it isn't true, right? And so if, if one believes that God used evolution in millions of years, it really destroys. We need to understand this because it's not just about what happened to Genesis. It's about what happened to the gospel and about what happens to what Jesus did because it destroys. If God used death, if he used evolution, if he used millions of years, it destroys the purpose of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? Because what exactly did Jesus die to redeem us from if the punishment for sin is not death, Right? What, did, what was he doing? And you know who really understands this well? It's the atheist. Now, I hope that's changing over time, right? That's why we do what we do here at the Creation Museum to help educate and equip people on this and what the Bible says. But the atheists get this. They understand this from Scripture, right? The following is a quote from a Christmas campaign by the American atheist a few years ago, and here's what they said. No Adam and Eve means no need for a Savior. It also means that the Bible cannot be trusted as a source of unambiguous literal truth. It is completely unreliable because it all begins with a myth and builds on that as a basis. No fallen man means no need for atonement and no need for a Redeemer. You know it. Now, I don't agree with the atheists very often, but they make an excellent point here. They say, if you don't have Adam and Eve, and you don't have sin, then you don't need a savior, right? Because what is he here to save us from, right? There is no fall, so there is no sin, so there is no need for redeemer, and there's no need for our atonement. And they say, if it all begins with a myth, then why believe any of the rest of it? We only really have two choices. It's either millions of years of death and disease and suffering that occurred before Adam's sin, so then death cannot be a punishment for sin, and it totally annihilates the purpose of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, or death is a punishment for Adam's sin, and Jesus died to redeem us from that punishment, right? That's why it's so important to believe that Genesis is true history, that death is the punishment for sin, that death is not very good, right? That sin and death are linked, and that sin would separate us from God for eternity, right? But Jesus became sin for us. That's what scripture says, and he died, and he resurrected so that our sins could be forgiven, and that we could live eternally with him. And you know, that promise of a Savior, was made to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They had just committed the first sin, right? The worst thing possible, and all of creation was cursed as a result. The ground has thorns and thistles, man dies, animals die. We would suffer pain and disease and death, but God had a plan, 
right? That's the good news of all of this. We have all this bad news in Genesis, but we have the good news of Jesus Christ. We have the good news of the gospel. And he revealed that plan to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.15 as he's cursing the serpent, right? Who um, Satan is in. Is in. Um, he says, and I will put enmity or hatred between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, capital S. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel, right? The seed that's being talked about here is Jesus Christ. And yes, Satan would strike at Jesus, right? He would die a horrific death on the cross, as we've already seen. He would strike his heel, but that's not a death blow, right? But Jesus would resurrect from the dead, and he would crush Satan's head. That is a death blow, and he would overcome um, death. And, over, and, and by the, his death um, and resurrection, pay the price for our sin so that we could do the same. Because of Genesis 3.15, that first messianic prophecy, God revealing his plan, we have John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, the whole purpose for the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is based on what happened in Genesis, right? It's based on that first Adam. Because if those first three chapters of Genesis do not present true history, right? If they really are not true, then you do not need the rest of the Bible. You don't. Because what's the rest of the Bible about? The prophecies of Jesus coming is life and it's coming again. And we don't need any of those things if what happened in Genesis 1 to 3 didn't happen, right? If that history is untrue. And we need to understand that. Often we'll put the Bible kind of upside down. Genesis is on the bottom, right? Because it's the first book of the Bible. And it's the foundation upon which everything else is built, including the gospel. That's why I say what we do here, it's not just about Genesis. It's not just about creation or origin. It's about the authority and the truthfulness of all of God's word, from the first verse to the last verse, and the very gospel itself. But people might say, okay, so is believing in Genesis as history, is this really necessary for salvation? So I ask you, does Romans 10, 9 say that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and believe in a young or six literal days, you will be saved? No, it does not say that, right? Instead, it just, that part isn't in there about believing in a young earth. It says, you will be saved, right? You repent and believe, you will be saved. So we might be tempted to think, okay, so if believing the Genesis account of creation and the fall it really isn't important, then, you know, because it's not necessary for salvation, it's sort of a side issue. It's not a, it's not a main issue. It's not a foundational issue. But here's the thing, and it's really illustrated well in this cartoon. This guy says, it's the New Testament that matters, not that Old Testament stuff, right? And we're being told that over and over again, sadly, by some even very well-known preachers that we can just leave, we don't have to worry about the Old Testament. We can just leave it out. You know, we're New Testament Christians. We just need to focus on the New Testament. But we need to understand that there are real problems if we try to unhitch, right? Or if we try to separate Genesis and the doctrines of creation and the fall, the history of Adam and Eve and what they did in the garden and the resulting curse on man from the gospel message. If we try to divorce those things because we're then removing the very foundation upon which the very gospel is built. For if by the one man's offense may die, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many, right? So if we choose to separate those two and we choose not to believe what happened in Genesis, it's gonna make us inconsistent as Christian, it's gonna undermine the authority of scripture, and it's gonna make us ineffective in our witness, right? Because once people stop believing that first part of the Bible, it's only a matter of time till they stop believing the rest of it either, right? If the miracles of creation aren't true, then why believe in the miracles of the virgin birth and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's only a matter of time. It's a slippery slope. And sadly, sadly, I have seen Christian going down that slippery slope. Stop believing in Genesis. Stop believing in Adam and Eve. Stop believing in the fall and what happens to the gospel. It's totally different. It's not what the Bible says. And because it undermines the authority of scripture, it undermines the, the gospel itself when we don't believe that history that's presented in Genesis. So it's important that we realize this, right? And that's why I end we're talking about the crucifixion and even the resurrection. We're talking about Genesis because Genesis is the very foundation upon which the gospel is built. And if we take away that history, then we take away the gospel that's rooted in that history as well. 
The Bible needs to be our thinking in every area, from the very first verse to the very last. And only then can we truly demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against knowledge of God and take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. That's the only way that we can do that. Now, I want to help you become equipped. I hope that this presentation has helped you gain a greater appreciation for what Christ did, because we need to understand that, right? We need to understand his divinity as well as his humanity and the price, the awesome price that he paid for us. But I want to help you know how you can become better equipped because in the, in the world that we live in today, people don't even know who Jesus is, right? So if we start with the gospel, right, it's, I mean, it's going to be confusing to a lot of people because they don't understand why they're sinners. They don't understand why they need to be saved or what they need to even be saved from. We have to start at a very different point, right? We have to start in Genesis. We have to start with God as the creator. We have to start with creation and Adam and Eve and their fall so that they can understand the reason for the, and the need for Jesus Christ. So how do we do that? Um, well, one of the things I want you to do is sign up at AnswersInsider.com for our uh, monthly newsletter. This is a great way to stay up to date with everything that's happening here at the Ark Encounter, the Creation Museum, and Answers in Genesis. Our resources are in there, so lots of great things for you. If you do this and sign up, you'll get a free digital download of Fire in My Bones, which is a testimony of Ken Ham, who is the um, founder and CEO of Answers in Genesis that built the Ark and the museum. So this is a great testimony in understanding why we do what we do. In defense of Easter, so I want to share some of our Easter products first. This is by Tim Chafee. He's going to be uh, talking the rest of this weekend. Um, he'll have two presentations that he'll address uh, some of these issues that he talks about in his book, In Defense of Easter, as well as in this DVD series, Risen Without a Doubt. Right? So talking about um, more focusing on the resurrection. So I kind of talked to you about the crucifixion. He's going to do the other part and talk to you more about the resurrection. You can also get information on that in the books, How Do We Know the Bible is True? Really being able to defend who Jesus is, his virgin birth, his death, and his resurrection. We also have this new little booklet called A, Bi a Biblical and Historical Look at Easter. Okay, so this is great. If you want something to hand out to people, and I know we're going through the current uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic right now, but these are great tools that you can use to really witness to people and help them know um, the truth about Easter. Because most uh, school-age children that are in the public school system, if you question them about Easter, they do not know why we celebrate it. They think it's the Easter Bunny, but it isn't, right? And we have to give them the truth. Uh, this book by uh, Simon Chirpin, he's the head of our UK office, 10 Biblical Reasons That Jesus Is God. Again, a great booklet for understanding more about this and helping people know truly who Jesus is and the purpose and meaning of life. Again, a great little pamphlet that you can hand to people as a witnessing tool to understand um, the history that's presented in Genesis and the gospel that's rooted in that history. Uh, as a couple of um, things here on Adam, because Adam and Eve and their very existence is being highly questioned within evangelical Christianity today. And here's the problem. Again, you probably already know what I'm going to say. If we do away with Adam and Eve, then we do away with the fall, then we do away with the gospel. So we need to defend their historicity. And so the genetics of Adam and Eve, which is a DVD that I did on this topic, as well as searching for Adam, are great tools to look at this from both a biblical and scientific standpoint. And um, again, um, show that they did exist and um, that science is consistent consistent with that. Uh, for children, uh, again, helping them understand this from a very young age, the true account of Adam and Eve, as well as A is for Adam. And I've been talking about this Again, we need to evangelize in a very different way. And Gospel Reset is a tremendous resource. You can probably read this book in two hours. But it's really eye-opening for help us, helping us know how we need to evangelize in a world that is totally biblically illiterate. Um, how do we do that? We have got to start in Genesis. We've got to start with God, the Creator. The lie of evolution in millions of years um, next to the Bible, um, this is the textbook of our ministry. It's who we are, and it's why we do what we do. The Answers books, one, two, three, and 4, as well as A Flood of Evidence, which is kind of like the fifth Answers book, these are great tools for helping you know how to equip yourself on the questions that people are asking. Where did King get his wife? How do you know a day means a day? What about millions of years, radiometric dating, dinosaurs, aliens, all of these things that people are questioning and asking, and we have opportunity to give them biblical as well as scientific answers. We have a version of this for teens as well as a version for children. These are great things to put um, in that Easter basket, right? Or great things to really equip and help them. They're going to last a lot longer, uh, so to speak, and be more fulfilling ultimately than 
all that candy. Um, Answers Magazine. This comes out six times a year. It's a great magazine for the whole family on building that biblical worldview, right? Looking at the current issues of our day, looking at the current things that are going on in science today, and being able to look at that biblically. Uh, so uh, there's a kids magazine in every uh, magazine that you get, as well as you'll get the digital edition too. Begin Book is a great book. I know, again, <laughs> During this pandemic, I think we have a great opportunity to witness to people because they're looking for answers, they're searching for things, and they've got time to think about it. So let's take advantage of that with some of the booklets that I talked about at the beginning, and even this book, Begin, which has portions of scripture beginning in Genesis going all the way to Revelation with some commentary to kind of tie it all together, and then what does it mean to be saved and answers to 10 most asked questions. So it's, I always call it the Bible in a nutshell, okay? So it's a great resource to give people to start um, reading scripture and understanding what the Bible means. Be sure to check out our live programs that are going on every day at 10, 12, 3, and 7 Eastern Time, as well as our special Answers Easter event. We have a lot more coming up on both Saturday and, some, and Sunday uh, for all ages of the family, even with special kids devotions. And so I encourage you to check out the schedule. Go to AnswersEaster.org. And please consider helping to sustain our ministry, right? The way that we're able to bring you this programming, especially during this time, is because of those donations that are very important important to us during this time that we have to be at the museum and the ark have to be closed. So please consider a gift of any amount is very, very helpful, helpful to us. You can go to answersandgenesis.org slash give. Thank you.